Hello everyone, welcome back to Ancient Greece and Rome. In this video, we're going to discuss some of the most important and influential of the ancient Near Eastern civilizations of the Bronze and Iron Ages. We will begin our discussion by talking about the Babylonian civilization, the heirs of the Sumerian civilization discussed in a previous lecture video. We'll talk about early Babylonia at the time of Hammurabi, and then we'll talk about the Neo-Babylonian civilization at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. After this, we'll discuss the Assyrian civilization of northwestern Mesopotamia. Specifically, we'll outline some of the differences between the Babylonians and the Assyrians, especially when it came to warfare. After this, we'll talk about some smaller ancient Near Eastern civilizations, namely the Phoenicians and the Hebrews. These civilizations, while not geographically large or militarily powerful, were highly influential in other ways, which we'll discuss later in the video. Finally, we'll conclude our discussion of the ancient Near Eastern civilizations by talking about the Persian Empire, also known as the Achaemenid Empire. We'll talk about the origins and the culture and the religion of the Achaemenid Empire. And then we'll talk about some of their architecture and artifacts and people. Let's start with the Babylonian civilization. The Babylonian civilization proper lasted from about 1895 BCE to about 539 BCE. The Babylonian Empire emerged in southern Mesopotamia out of the ashes of the old Akkadian Empire, which we talked about in a previous video. The Babylonians spoke a similar language to the Akkadians, and they used the cuneiform writing system as well. The Babylonians also had similar architectural traditions, especially when it came to the construction of ziggurats. But the Babylonians included additional experimentation and advancement in their construction, which we'll talk about later. There are two distinct periods of major influence in cultural hegemony by the Babylonians. The early period from about 1895 to about 1595 BCE and the Neo-Babylonian also known as the Chaldean period from about 620 to 539 BCE at which point the civilization lost its independence. Between these two periods the Babylonian Empire existed but it was less influential. It was divided by civil wars or it was under foreign occupation from other empires, like the Hittites or the Assyrians. This period between the early Babylonians and the Neo-Babylonians was somewhat like the intermediate periods the ancient Egyptian civilization experienced. We talked about these intermediate periods in a previous video. Here is the heart of the Babylonian civilization on a map. As you can see, the center of the Babylonian civilization was in southern Mesopotamia, near where the old Akkadian Empire was. Here's Uruk and Ur discussed previously. Babylon is here, a little bit to the north, between the Euphrates and the Tigris. This is now modern-day Iraq. And now we'll talk about what is perhaps the most enduring contribution of the early Babylonian civilization, Hammurabi's Code of Laws. The early Babylonian civilization's most important leader, Hammurabi, was the sixth king of the first dynasty. As king, Hammurabi produced over 280 laws, which were codified between 1755 and 1750 BCE. Hammurabi's laws were recorded in Akkadian cuneiform on a stele that would be placed in public where all literate people would be able to read it. The stele shown on this slide was about seven and a half feet tall and two feet wide. 
At the top of the stele, there is an image of King Hammurabi receiving the law code from the god Shamash, the Babylonian god of the sun and of justice. This divine image would have legitimized not only Hammurabi's rule, but his law code as well in the eyes of his subjects. Many of Hammurabi's laws will seem barbaric to us today. For example, punishments like mutilation as a penalty for theft and liberal use of capital punishment as a penalty for a variety of crimes. But Hammurabi's standardized code of laws, a legal system that everyone could know and understand, was a massive political and cultural development for the time. The law was no longer a mystery. People had a code by which they could live their lives and do business. It's also worth noting that Hammurabi's code contained a presumption of innocence, meaning that an accused person, a defendant, would be treated as innocent until proven guilty, just like the modern American legal code another accomplishment of Hammurabi's Law Code. Hammurabi's Law Code would have inspired other ancient legal codes, including the Mosaic Law, which is described in the Old Testament or the Torah. The Jewish Books of the Law. Here are some close-ups of the stele that contains Hammurabi's code. Here we can see Hammurabi receiving the law code from Shamash, the Babylonian god of justice. He's also considered to be a god of the sun as well. Here is an image of the excavation of the stele before it was moved to the Louvre in Paris. Here is a close-up of the cuneiform writing system on which the code was recorded. Now we'll look, we'll look at a few more examples of Babylonian art from the early period. The Babylonians during this period and throughout their history generally preferred carved reliefs. Unlike the ancient Egyptians who preferred to either make statues or two-dimensional artwork, as we saw in a previous video. The ancient Egyptians made carved reliefs as well, but they tended to be inset, unlike the Babylonian reliefs, where the figures are meant to stand out and project out from a stone, as you can see on this slide here. Religious scenes are common in Babylonian reliefs. Um, the reliefs would have originally been painted, but most of the paint has been faded since these, relief, these reliefs were outdoors. This slide shows what some of these reliefs would have looked like after they had been made. These reliefs display some combination of animal and human features on their subjects. But the Babylonians preferred to portray their deities their gods and goddesses with human heads, animal limbs, and body parts, unlike the Egyptians who preferred to show their gods and goddesses with animal heads but human bodies. Let's look a little bit more closely at this image here. It's of the Queen of Night, also known as the Burney Relief. It's believed to be of Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of sex and warfare, who evolved from the Sun Marian deity Inanna that we discussed previously. As you can see, there's a light, a bit of a likeness between the face of the Queen of Night, presumably Ishtar, and the goddess Inanna, whose mask we viewed in a previous lecture. Now we can talk a little bit more about the Babylonian religion and their pantheon of deities. Like the Egyptians and so many other ancient civilizations, the Babylonians were polytheistic, meaning they worshiped many gods. Here are a few examples of some of the gods they worshiped. 
They worship the God of the sky. They worship gods of the sun and gods of the land. They also had gods for fire as well. This diagram on the right hand side compares some of the Babylonian deities to the deities of the Greeks and the Romans, suggesting that Babylonian religious beliefs may have spread westward to the civilizations of Greece and eventually to Rome. Although both the Babylonians and the Egyptians were polytheistic, the Babylonian religion was much more cynical and nihilistic than that of the Egyptians. The Babylonian gods and goddesses were portrayed as being much more capricious and unpredictable, even mercurial. Humans could not always know what the gods were doing, and they could not trust the gods either. Perhaps the best example of the capriciousness of the Babylonian gods and goddesses and the overall nihilism of Babylonian spirituality can be seen in the Epic of Gilgamesh, a tale that we discussed briefly in a previous lecture that may have been based on the exploits of the Akkadian ruler Sargon the Great. Here's a brief recap of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh is the king of Uruk. He is said to be two-thirds god and one-third man. Although he is mostly god and only part man, the other the other gods do not trust Gilgamesh. They find him to be dangerous, and they are afraid of his power. As a result, one of the gods, named Enki, creates a bull-slash-man hybrid called Enkidu, shown here, who is supposed to fight Gilgamesh and keep him busy so that he cannot threaten the gods. Enkidu and Gilgamesh fight, but instead of becoming enemies, they become friends. And as friends, they kill the Bull of Heaven, the property of the gods. Gilgamesh also turns down the advances of Ishtar, the goddess of love, sex, and warfare, further alienating Gilgamesh from the gods. The gods decide that Gilgamesh is even more dangerous with Enkidu, so they cause Enkidu to die. Enkidu's death gives Gilgamesh a glimpse of mortality and sends about on a mission to discover a path to eternal life. He meets a man named Utnapishtim who survived a, a global flood. Utnapishtim is a Noah-like figure. Utnapishtim tells Gilgamesh that he must eat a magical plant, which Gilgamesh finds, but then the plant is stolen by a snake. In the end, Gilgamesh must be content knowing that he too will die like his friend in Kidu. As you can see, it's a story that doesn't have a very happy ending. It's about death and the loss of a friend and recognizing one's own mortality. In a way, it fits very well with the beliefs that Babylonians had about their gods, that their gods and goddesses were not to be trusted, and that they really didn't care very much about humans. Archaeologists and scholars debate why the Babylonians and the Egyptians may have had such different ideas about gods and goddesses. Some postulate that the Babylonians mistrusted their gods because they lived in a more volatile part of the world, namely when it came to flooding. The Tigris and Euphrates rivers flooded far more unpredictably than the floods of the Nile River, which flooded seasonally. Whereas flooding was a blessing to the ancient Egyptians, it could be a curse to the ancient Babylonians, which may be why they viewed their gods differently. Now we'll talk a little bit about Babylonian monumental architecture, namely their ziggurats. The example we're using here is from Ur, a city that's much older than the Babylonians, but became very important to the Babylonian civilization. Remember, the peoples of Mesopotamia tended to use a lot more mud bricks in their construction than other civilizations, meaning that even their greatest, most impressive buildings would break down with time, leaving behind tells, like you can see here. On top of these tells, ziggurats would be built, but even the ziggurats would break down and have to be reconstructed, as you can see here in this modern reconstruction 
or in this artist's rendition of what a ziggurat may have looked like. Now let's talk about the Neo-Babylonian Empire. The Neo-Babylonian Empire lasted from about 620 to 539 BCE. The Neo-Babylonian Empire was known for its monumental architecture and military conquests, unlike early Babylon, which was known for its religious developments and law codes. The most famous Neo-Babylonian ruler was King Nebuchadnezzar II, who's mentioned in the Hebrew religious texts. The Neo-Babylonian civilization reached its peak under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar II. The Neo-Babylonian Empire is a lot like the New Kingdom for ancient Egypt, and Nebuchadnezzar II is a lot like what Ramses the Great was for the Egyptians. The Babylonian civilization came to an end in 539 BCE as an independent entity after being conquered once and for all by the Achaemenid Empire. Here is a map showing the Neo-Babylonian Empire at its greatest extent. As you can see, it's extended significantly beyond its original cultural territory in southern Mesopotamia here. It extends to the Persian Gulf, all the way into Asia Minor, Anatolia, along the eastern Mediterranean coast, and to the borders of Egypt, and then down into the Arabian Peninsula. It has completely swallowed up other civilizations, including the Hebrew civilization, which is about here. The Neo-Babylonians would have built ziggurats, but they also built walls and gates for their cities. One of the best examples is the Ishtar Gate. The Ishtar Gate was made of bricks, but it was covered in this beautiful blue lapis lazuli stone. It also was decorated with animals to signify the strength and power of the Neo-Babylonian civilization. Travelers visiting the ancient city of Babylon would have been impressed and put into awe and wonder as they passed through this gate with its shiny blue stones and impressive but intimidating animals. Here are some images of close-ups of the Ishtar Gate and the animals mentioned previously. Here we see a lion, an important symbol of strength particularly military strength to the Babylonians and other Mesopotamian civilizations. We also see a bull, which symbolized strength as well, but also symbolized agricultural production. I think the most interesting animal we see here is the mythical dragon, which would have symbolized a type of spiritual power, perhaps the power of the Babylonians' religion. There's also images of plants, some people think that these are date palms, an important food source in the ancient Near East. Here also in the center is what the Ishtar Gate looked like shortly after its excavation, before its restoration. Now we can discuss some of the mythical monumental architecture of the Neo-Babylonian civilization, specifically the Hanging Gardens. Documentary sources talk about a series of hanging gardens built by Babylonian kings where they could have parties and have liaisons with the women in their harems. We don't, however, know where these hanging gardens would have been, or even if they were, in fact, real ziggurats, real buildings. Some archaeologists and scholars think that the hanging gardens of Babylon may have just been a simple ziggurat with date trees and plants planted on its top. Others think that these gardens may not have even been built by the Babylonians, by another civilization, and that the Babylonians were simply taking credit for the gardens. Now we'll talk a little bit more about Nebuchadnezzar II, also known as Nebuchadnezzar the Great, to the Babylonians. 
He was the king of the Neo-Babylonian civilization during its greatest military power and territorial extent. Naturally, he would have been a very impressive and inspiring figure to the Babylonian people. But to the civilizations that were conquered by the Babylonians, he would have been a monster, something to be feared, perhaps even a madman, as he is displayed in the Hebrew stories from the period. The Babylonians practiced the forced cultural assimilation of conquered peoples. They would move conquered peoples deeper into their empire, where they would be acculturated to Babylonian ways. This is mentioned in documentary sources from the period, including the Hebrew Bible. Nebuchadnezzar II appeared to be a successful military leader, extending the Neo-Babylonian Empire's territories, but his successors were far less successful and motivated than he was. He, Nebuchadnezzar extended the empire's territory and conquered surrounding civilizations, including the Hebrews of the Levant, as shown in the background of this slide. When the Babylonian forces almost destroy the city of Jerusalem. Like Ramses the Great of Egypt, Nebuchadnezzar's descendants were not able to maintain the empire that Nebuchadnezzar had built for them on the right. We see King Balthazar, one of Nebuchadnezzar's successors, who in the Hebrew Bible was warned by God that he and the Babylonian Empire would be destroyed for their pride and for their greed and violence. The Neo-Babylonian civilization collapsed after the invasion of the Achaemenid Empire in 539 BCE. The destruction of the Neo-Babylonian civilization is attested in the Hebrew Bible, but it's also discussed by the Greek historian Herodotus as well. Now we'll discuss the Assyrian civilization, which existed during the intermediate period between the old Babylonian empire of Hammurabi and the Neo-Babylonian empire of Nebuchadnezzar. The Assyrian empire shared many cultural similarities with the Babylonians, being that they were both Mesopotamian civilizations, but the Assyrian empire was even more warlike than the Babylonians were and even more cruel to the people they conquered. They are a very warlike and militaristic civilization. Some of their most important leaders were Sargon II, named after the founder of the Akkadian Empire, and Sennacherib. They conquered many other civilizations in the ancient Near East and adjacent regions, including the northern Hebrew Kingdom of Israel, they also conquered the Egyptian civilization, as discussed in a previous video. The Assyrians, as mentioned before, were extremely harsh to conquered peoples. They practiced things that we might call ethnic cleansing, even genocide today, far more so than the Babylonians, who really wanted to make conquered peoples assimilate and become Babylonian. The Assyrians copied many elements of Babylonian art and religion, making them more warlike. The Assyrians are best remembered for their wars and their cities and palaces that they built using the spoils of the peoples they conquered. Here is a map showing the extent of the Assyrian Empire. They expanded well beyond Mesopotamia through the Levantine region and all the way to Egypt. Here we'll look at some Assyrian reliefs and artwork. As you can see, there's many similarities between Babylonian and Assyrian sculpt artwork and reliefs. But the Assyrians reliefs show many more scenes of violence, military battles and hunts against wild animals. We can get a view of the Assyrians' war chariots here, and we can show them hunting a lion with very graphic terms here. We also see that the Assyrians, like the Babylonians, 
and even earlier Mesopotamian civilizations like the Akkadians and the Sumerians portray their men with rectangular beards and long hair woven into braids. The Assyrians also like to give their human subjects animal features like eagle wings. You can also see the Assyrian sculptors are putting effort and energy into making their subjects look strong and muscular and powerful. Although the reliefs of later civilizations will be more anatomically realistic. Here we can see Assyrian sculptures that feature humans with animal bodies. As I mentioned before, the Mesopotamian civilizations preferred to show deities with human heads and animal bodies, the opposite of the Egyptians. Favorite animals are lions, as well as bulls, both of which represent strength, different kinds of strength, however. One of the reasons the Assyrians were so militarily powerful came from their early adoption of iron weapons. Here, the right hand side of the side, you can see an Assyrian sickle sword. Iron is stronger than bronze, and it's also cheaper and easier to smelt, allowing metallurgists to make better swords, spears, and also better armor that offers more coverage, as seen here on this slide, with the Assyrian soldiers wearing scale armor that extends from their neck all the way down to their feet. Iron could also be used to make stronger siege engines, like this battering ram shown here, which would have allowed the Assyrians to more easily defeat cities that they besieged. Here are some artists' modern renditions of Assyrian warfare and combat. As you can see, the Assyrians are using iron weapons, which are much stronger and give them much better protection. They also use siege engines, and here on this side slide, you see them using large chariots. As I mentioned in a previous video, chariots were both the tanks and the sports cars of the ancient Near East. Here is a look at Asher, the Assyrian capital city. Asher was also the name of the Assyrian god of war. You can see they were using mud bricks to build their buildings, as shown by these reconstructions made by archaeologists. You can also notice the arches as well. They're a hybrid or a transition between the corbelled arches of the ancient Mesopotamians and the proper arches that we see in later Greek and Roman architecture. As the bricks are tilted away from each other, they're not parallel with the bricks of the wall, but they're not completely in line with the edge of the arch, meaning it's a hybrid between a corbel arch and a proper arch. Here's a reconstruction of what Asher may have looked like in ancient times. Here's a reconstruction of what the palace of Sargon II might have looked like. Sargon II was one of the most powerful of the ancient Assyrian rulers. Seen here on the left side of the slide. Notice the detail the sculptors have given to the muscles on his forearms. As you can see, Sargon's palace was heavily fortified, much like a fortress, highlighting the militarism of the ancient Assyrian society. Here's a floor plan of Sargon's palace with temples, courts, storage rooms, etc. We can also see some of the statuary that would have decorated the palace itself and showed off Sargon's might and wealth and power. Now we'll take a look at Nineveh, 
which is probably the most influential Assyrian city. If Ashur was the political capital, then Nineveh was the cultural capital of the Assyrian Empire. Here we see the reliefs have been colored and painted as the Babylonians would have done. Nowadays, the paint has long since disappeared, but you can see the action and the movement depicted in the reliefs of Nineveh. This relief shows the walls of the city and it shows military scenes in the foreground. It also shows a river in the center, just like how the city of Nineveh had a river running through the town center. Here's a map of Nineveh with a river running through it, as I mentioned. This river would have provided water to the residents. It also could have been a form of transportation as well. The gates of the city are named after various Mesopotamian gods, including Shamash, the god of the sun and justice, and Nurgle, the god of death. The city was severely damaged and almost destroyed in the year 612 BCE. Its destruction is described in contemporary written sources like the Hebrew Bible. Although some scholars and archaeologists think that the biblical story probably exaggerates the level of destruction that Nineveh experienced. But this story does reveal how much the peoples who were conquered by the Assyrians hated and detested the people who had destroyed their cities and enslaved their people. Here we'll discuss the destruction of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrian Empire grew quickly thanks to its militarism, but it made numerous enemies on its way to the top. In about the 16, 620s BCE, the empire experienced a series of civil wars fought over who would be the next king of the Assyrian Empire. These civil wars greatly weakened the empire, leading Assyria's vassals and rivals to rise up in a coalition against Assyria. These powers, including Babylon and the Medes, dismembered Assyria over the course of about 15 years, which is really extremely fast by ancient world standards. Now we'll discuss some of the smaller but not insignificant civilizations of the ancient Near East. The first we'll talk about is the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians' most long-lasting contribution to the world's culture is the development of the first alphabet, which you can see here. The Phoenicians, rather than being militaristic like the Assyrians and the Babylonians, were primarily an economic and trade-based civilization. They were excellent seafarers and sold their goods across the Mediterranean. Because they were traders and because they would have been keeping track of large numbers of goods and wares, they would have needed an easy to use writing system. And an alphabet in which sig symbols represented sounds would be much simpler to use and learn than the notch-based cuneiform system of Mesopotamia. Here are some images of Assyrian ships Sea-based trade was the lifeblood of the Assyrian civilization. They bought and sold goods from all across the Mediterranean and became very wealthy. They sold wood and purple dye, which you'll see on a new, another slide, and they bought oil and wine and many other goods and became very wealthy, even though their territorial holdings in the ancient Near East were comparatively small. Ruins of their ships, sunken ruins of their ships, can be found across the Mediterranean, like this vessel here, which was found off the coast of Spain, highlighting just how far the Assyrians had traveled.
Here is a map showing how far the ancient Phoenicians traveled on their trade missions. They sold dye made from seashells so that clothing and other textiles could be dyed this purple, purplish red color. This dye was very expensive and purple quickly became a royal color worn by kings and members of the elite classes who could afford the expensive dye sold by the Phoenicians. We'll talk more about the Phoenicians, specifically their city of Carthage, in a later video. Another smaller but very influential civilization we'll talk about from the ancient Near East was the Hebrew civilization. The Hebrews, also known as the Israelites, were best known for their monotheistic spiritual beliefs which would inspire the creation of multiple religions still practiced today, namely Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Here on this slide, you can see some of the ways in which the ancient Hebrew people worshiped their God, whom we think they called Yahweh. They worshiped their God in a tent called a tabernacle shown here when the Hebrew people were nomadic, which they were for a good portion of their history. After the Hebrew people settled down in the Levantine region, they built a temple to their God, shown here. The temple presumably was destroyed by the Babylonians when the Babylonian Empire took over the last of the Hebrew civilization about 586 to 585 BCE. The Hebrews also left extensive written records about their spiritual and religious beliefs and how they evolved over time, as seen in the Dead Sea Scrolls of Qumran, which were discovered in the 1940s and 1950s of the Common Era. These scrolls form the basis and the original sources for the modern Hebrew Bible, known as the Tanakh, as well as many Christian religious written texts as well. Now we'll discuss some additional archaeological finds relating to the Hebrew civilization. Perhaps one of the most important from this period is the Tel Dan inscription. As described in Hebrew religious documents, David, King David, was a warrior king of the Hebrew people ruling from about 1000 BCE in Jerusalem, which he captured for the Hebrew people. Here is part of a bust of King David, although this bust was probably made long after he would have existed. Scholars initially thought that David was a mythic or spiritual figure, but in recent years, and recent discoveries have given credence that David may have been a historical figure as well. The Tel Dan inscription from about the 900s to 800s BCE, found around the year 1994 of the Common Era, mentions a victory over the House of David by another people group in the ancient Near East. The inscription is from a people called the Arameans, and it's also written in the Phoenician alphabet, which is interesting, showing how the Phoenician script had spread throughout the region because of its utility. The stone also suggests the Hebrew civilization was divided into two separate kingdoms, which is also noted by the Jewish Tanakh in the Christian Old Testament. This is a monumental find in architectural history. as it shed new light on the religious figure of King David. Now we'll discuss the Achaemenid Empire. The Achaemenid Empire, which lasted from about 550 to 330 BCE, was larger than any previous empire in world history. Also known as the Persian Empire, since the Persians were the ruling class of the Achaemenid Empire. The Achaemenid Empire spread over three continents, Africa, Asia, and Europe, 
reaching India in the east, the Balkans in Europe in the northwest, and then Egypt in the southwest. The Achaemenid Empire was multi-ethnic and multi-racial. It included Near Easterners, Asians, Europeans, and Africans. The empire was also more multicultural and tolerant than other empires, civilizations that had been discussed previously. The Achaemenids allowed conquered peoples to practice their religion and culture as long as they paid their taxes and supplied warriors to the Achaemenid army via the satrap system. There were, of course, some trend, exceptions to this trend, especially in places like Egypt, which frequently rebelled against the Achaemenid Empire. Some famous Achaemenid rulers included Cyrus the Great and Darius I. We'll also discuss the art and culture and architecture of the Achaemenid Empire as well. Here is the Achaemenid Empire at its greatest extent, which it reached under the rule of Darius I. As you can see, it spreads as far east as India, and it spreads into Europe as well, north of Greece. It also extends south, down through Egypt and Libya and North Africa. It also occupies Mesopotamia, and the territories of the old Assyrian and Babylonian empires, as well as the Phoenician and Hebrew civilizations. Let's briefly talk about the origins of the Achaemenid Empire. The Persians, the ruling class of the Achaemenid Empire, were originally confederations of semi-nomadic tribes from the Zagros Mountains in what is now Iran. They conquered the more sedentary Median Empire in the region, about 550 BCE. Then they had turned their attention to the west. They conquered Mesopotamia and the Neo-Babylonian Empire in 539 BCE, along with the Lydian Empire of Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and then Egypt by 525 BCE. The Achaemenids fielded large multi-ethnic armies, units called Immortals, were the dominant force in the Achaemenid army. They earned this name, the Immortals, because they always kept at least 10,000 effective troops on the ground, leading their enemies to suggest that the Persian troops were immortal because they just never seemed to run out of soldiers. The Achaemenids fought the Greek city-states for over half a century, from about 499 to 449 BCE but they failed to conquer all of the Greek city-states, at least in Greece. They did conquer some of the Greek colonies in Anatolia and what is now Turkey. Here are some modern recreations of Persian soldiers in the Persian Immortal Army. The Persians liked bright patterned clothing, unlike other civilizations like the Egyptians as shown in these images. The Immortals also used a variety of weapons and armor, reflecting the multi-ethnic and even multicultural nature of the Achaemenid Empire. They used a variety of weapons made from a variety of materials, including both iron and bronze. Their colors were anything but drab, as they have been portrayed in certain recent films. The Persians, the ruling class of the Achaemenid Empire, spoke a Proto-Indo-European language. Yet, when they built the Achaemenid Empire, they adopted the millennia-old cune cuneiform script, probably because it would have been familiar to their conquered subjects, especially the Babylonians. The decision to adopt cuneiform reflected the Achaemenid Empire's diversity and pluralism as they used elements and cultural mores from the peoples that they conquered. Here we'll take a look at some of the Achaemenid art and reliefs. As you can see, 
the Akamena reliefs have significant artistic influence from Mesopotamia. But they are a little bit less stylized and a bit more anatomically realistic. The Akamenids also display most of their everyday people, at least everyday males, with shorter beards and shorter hair than the Babylonians did. Apparently, the Achaemenids reserved longer hair and beards for their kings. We also see some scenes of Achaemenid warfare in the bottom section of this slide. You can see that they're giving attention to the muscles of their subjects, but they're doing so in a way that's more anatomically accurate and realistic than that of the Assyrians, which was much more stylized. We also see the Achaemenids displaying their male subjects with headdresses of some kind. These hats here may have been helmets, or they may have been hats were worn as a sign of modesty to protect their hair. We also see the pluralism of the Achaemenid culture in their relief art. Their reliefs show people in a variety of ethnic clothing and garb, as seen in this Zoroastrian image here. The reliefs also would have been painted, and although these pigments have faded over time, some scholars think that the Achaemenids may have given their subjects different skin tones to reflect the multiracial nature of the Achaemenid populace. The Achaemenids also depicted Greeks, their arch rivals in their art as well, not always as enemies, but actually in surprisingly nuanced ways. In some cases, they depicted Greek soldiers called hoplites here as possible allies. This is probably because many Greek soldiers served as mercenaries in the Achaemenid armies. There were also ethnically Greek conquered peoples from Anatolia and Asia Minor in the Achaemenid Empire as well. Here are some images of Atosa, the famous Achaemenid queen. Atosa was the daughter of Cyrus the Great. She later married Darius I. The bust of her likeness can be seen at the right hand side of this slide. An artist recreation of what she may have looked like based on the bust can be seen at left. Although she lived in the 500s BCE, Tosa's bust bears many similarities to the Inanna mask from over 2,500 years earlier, seen in the center. You notice some of the similarities in the forehead and eyes. Here is Cyrus the Great, the Achaemenid warrior king. Cyrus lived from about 600 to 530 BCE. 70 years, a good long life by ancient world standards. The evidence suggests that Cyrus was healthy and physically strong, being a hunter and a warrior. Cyrus, through his military exploits, the conquest of the Medes and the Babylonians especially, gave the Persian people the Achaemenid Empire. Although he was very militaristic and conquered many people groups, Cyrus himself was fairly pluralistic. He allowed conquered peoples to maintain their cultural and spiritual beliefs so long as they remained obedient to the empire. Cyrus was militaristic, as I mentioned before, and he died in battle fighting a people group called the Masagatai. The Masagatai were a nomadic people of the Eurasian steppe. Cyrus was buried in a tomb at the city of Pasar Gade. You can see his tomb at left. It's reminiscent of a miniature ziggurat. On the whole, Cyrus is considered to be one of the best Achaemenid kings for his military exploits and the pluralism and magnanimity he showed to the people he conquered. He's celebrated by some of the people he conquered, including the Hebrews. Another very important 
Achaemenid king was Darius I, who ruled from 522 to 486 BCE. There was one king between Darius and Cyrus named Cambyses, who was not considered to be a good king. Darius was known more for his administrative rule rather than his military exploits, which were less successful than those of Cyrus. Darius is also known for beginning the wars against the Greek city-states, probably his biggest mistake. Darius kept the pluralistic traditions of the Achaemenid Empire going, although there were some exceptions during the Babylonian, Egyptian, and Ionian revolts. Darius also oversaw the construction of roads and infrastructure, and even a postal service, so that he could better communicate with his satraps in other parts of the empire. Like Cyrus, he's also considered to be one of the best of the Achaemenid rulers, even if he did make some mistakes. Now we'll talk a little bit about the Achaemenid's religion, Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism was the official religion of the Achaemenid Empire. Other religions, including Egyptian and Mesopotamian polytheism, in Judaism were followed by certain conquered peoples as well. But they were allowed to observe their religion so long as they remained subservient to the empire. Zoroastrianism is based on the teachings of Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra, pictured here. Zoroastrianism as a religion stresses the battle between cosmic good, Ahura Mazda, and cosmic evil, Angra Mainyu. Zoroastrians constructed fire temples, shown here, where they commemorated the flames, which were and are seen as holy. Zoroastrianism may have influenced other religions, including both Buddhism and Christianity, and Zoroastrianism is still practiced today in parts of Asia and the Near East. By the way, this is a very simple discussion of the religious beliefs of the Zoroastrianisms so far as they are relevant to the Achaemenid Empire. I've obviously had to simplify these things, and I mean no respect to anyone who might be following this religion. On the left part of this slide is a depiction of Ahura Mazda, who represents the cosmic good. On the right is Angra Manu, represented as a monster. Good and evil must vie against each other in an eternal struggle, according to Zoroastrianism. As a religion, Zoroastrianism teaches that earth, fire, and water, the fundamental elements, are holy, and they must not be polluted by burial or decomposition. As such, Achaemenids who followed Zoroastrianism practiced unique burial rites involving Towers of Silence. Towers of Silence essentially were open-air charnel houses in which the bodies of the newly deceased would be placed. These bodies would be left to decompose in the open air, and carrion birds like vultures would eat the flesh of the dead until only the bones remained. The bones, denuded of their flesh, would then be placed in the central well here after they decomposed along the edges of the tower. Over time, the bones in the central well would break down. And in this way, Zoroastrians don't have to bury the bodies of the dead or cremate them as other cultures did, nor do they have to mummify them the way the Egyptians did. Let's talk about the architecture of some of the Achaemenid cities, because the architecture of these cities reflects the pluralism of their culture. First, we'll talk about Persepolis, which was the Achaemenid imperial capital and ceremonial complex. It was really a large collection of palaces and not a city in the sense of child's definition. But the architecture is very interesting, and it's emblematic of the values of the Achaemenid Empire. In this slide, we can see multiple architectural styles being used simultaneously. We see stonework that's reminiscent 
of ancient Egyptian architecture, as you can see with the pediments here at the top of these portals. Portal is, of course, a fancy term for a doorway. We can also see these columns here, these lines called fluting, were very important in Greek architecture. As I mentioned, there were Greek people who were conquered in parts of Anatolia. And it's possible the Persians may have learned how to build columns like this there. Here's some more views of Persepolis's architecture. The capitals of these co columns are very reminiscent of the capitals of Egyptian columns. They look a lot like papyrus. We can also see Mesopotamian style statues with human heads placed on animal bodies. Here is a plan of Persepolis. As you can see, it's multiple palaces guarded with a wall, similar to the Assyrian palaces, which were also guarded with walls. Here's its location in what is now present day Iran. While Persepolis may have been the legal de jure capital of the Achaemenid Empire, Susa was the de facto cultural capital of the Achaemenid civilization. Susa actually predates the Persians by millennia. It may have been founded as early as 4400 BCE. The city was also inhabited until 1219 of the Common Era when it was destroyed by the Mongols. Stratigraphy of the site shows multiple layers of occupation, including tells seen here. Susa is in the perfect location for a city. There's abundant water resources in the form of rivers and springs. There's plains for agriculture, and there's the nearby Zagros Mountains, which would have possessed mineral resources that could be mined. The Achaemenids also kept most of their administrative state in Susa, since, as I said, Persepolis was really just a very large palace complex. Here are some more views of Susa. As you can see, there's water sources very close to the city, including springs, which would have allowed the residents of Susa to support lush gardens and rich agricultural fields. The city would have possessed numerous examples of monumental architecture, as shown by archeologists' reconstructions and artists' recreations of the city. The buildings have some resemblance to the older Mesopotamian ziggurats, seen here with their levels, which shows the long cultural and architectural traditions of the ancient Near East. Conclusion. Once again, we've covered a lot of ground in this video. Well over a millennia of time, and multiple civilizations. What I hoped you saw, though, was that there is great diversity amongst the civilizations that inhabited the ancient Near East, from the militaristic Assyrians to the more pluralistic Achaemenids. There was major cultural syncretism and sharing of cultural traditions even within this diversity, though. For example, many of the civilizations adopted cuneiform or the Phoenician alphabet. These civilizations also built monumental architecture and created artwork reminiscent of the old Mesopotamian civilizations, but they made their own unique advancements and modifications. These civilizations shared spiritual and religious ideas, but they also developed new religions as well, like Zoroastrianism. Warfare, especially with the introduction of iron weapons, could allow a civilization to rapidly increase its territorial holdings. But war could be its undoing as well. You might say that war could be a double-edged sword. Because of their wars, the Assyrians made too many enemies, leading to their destruction. 
The Babylonians, because of their wars, could not maintain their expanded empire. And the Persians' failed conflict with the Greeks turned this far-off, seemingly isolated European people into an extremely dangerous adversary that would ultimately destroy the Persian Empire in the end. But we'll talk more about that in a future video.